The purpose of this video is to introduce you to the concept that a magnetic field can be created by a current carrying wire and to help you learn how to calculate that field. This idea that a current carrying wire creates its own magnetic field, also known as electromagnetism or the basics of electromagnetism, was first discovered on accident by Hans Christian Orsted in 1820. He was a university professor who was doing a demonstration during a lecture that involved him um, using a current traveling through a wire, and he was able to turn that current on and off. And anytime he turned the current on, he noticed that there was a a uh, needle of a magnetic compass nearby, and that needle would deflect or move anytime the current was turned on, um, which would indicate that there was a, a magnetic field other than the Earth's magnetic field when there's a current on. So this was something that was pretty shocking to him. And um, shortly thereafter, there were two French physicists who um, started researching this idea. And after a whole bunch of experimentation, um, they came up with the following relationship. The fact that um, the magnetic field or a little bit of magnetic field can be expressed as mu naught over four pi times the current uh, dl cross r hat over r squared. This expression, uh, this known as the Biot Savar law, named after those two French physicists who discovered this law, um, can be used to determine the magnetic field due to the current in any um, kind of arbitrarily shaped wire. So as you see here in this diagram, we have this wire that has some curves to it, and um, we will approach using this law by choosing a small section of that wire and coming up with an expression for the magnetic field for that small section of wire. Um, we'll say that small section of wire has a length dl, in this diagram here, it's ds instead of dl. Um, and um, we'll look at the magnetic field created by that little piece of wire. So a few things about this equation. First of all, mu naught is a constant in the equation. It is equal to four pi times 10 to the negative seventh Tesla meters per ampere. Secondly, dl, which is our little bit of length of our wire, that's our vector, um, similar to how um, length was the vector in our magnetic force expression. Um, that dl has the same direction as the direction of the current because it comes from that idea of the velocity of a positive particle. And lastly, r hat's a unit vector. So that tells us it has a length of one and it um, points from the wire to the point where you're trying to find the magnetic field. So as you see um, in the diagram here, it's that kind of magenta looking uh, unit vector that points from the wire to that point P. So now that we know this law, Kind of the basics behind this law. We're going to look at two examples of applying it to come up with an expression of um, a magnetic field both due to a long straight wire and then due to a circular arc of wire. So our goal here is to derive an expression for the magnetic field at a point P and our point P is located a distance capital R from a long straight wire and that long straight wire has a constant current of I. And we're going to assume that current is traveling upward. Um, we'll talk about later what would happen if it was traveling downward instead of upward. So for starters, we know that we're going to apply the Biot of our law. And so I rewrote the law here, always starting with an equation that's on the equation sheet. Our general method is that we're going to start by finding the magnitude of the magnetic field. We'll take care of direction later. And we want to know a little bit of magnetic field that's created by a small piece of wire. That small piece of wire is going to have a length dl. And um, in this case, that small piece of wire is located a distance r from the point p. And so um, I have added to my diagram um, where that little piece of wire is located. I just arbitrarily picked a point. Um, it's length vector dl is pointed upward since we're saying that the current is traveling upward and i added the r little r vector into my diagram 
But remember, in um, the BS of our law, we really have r hat, which is just a unit vector. So it's not the same length as the r vector shown on my diagram here. Um, but it does point from that little piece of wire to the point P. So of course, just as we've done in many other situations, uh, we need to add up all of those little bits of magnetic field for every little piece of wire. And we do so by taking an integral. So if we think about that integral, for every piece of wire that we choose, let's say we choose multiple pieces of wire, um, the little value, the little r is going to vary as well as the sine of theta. And um, just for clarification, that sine theta came from looking at the magnitude of the cross product. Um, and so we know that if we're doing magnitude of the cross product, it's the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second vector times the sine of theta. And since it was cross r hat, r hat just has a magnitude of one. So that's why that changed to IDL sine theta. Since both r and sine theta are going to vary, we're going to have to express them in terms of L. I've defined L as being um, the distance from that little piece of wire to a point that's directly across from P. And if you look at my diagram, L um, is drawn in as an arrow, um, as an orange arrow. So we can kind of get a feel for what we're talking about when we say L. I chose to call it L since my expression is in terms of DL. So writing R um, and sine theta in terms of L looks something like this. That sine theta, which is opposite over hypotenuse, would be R, big R over little r, where little r is equal to the square root of L squared plus R squared. Um, so plugging these into our expression uh, yields this result right here. Of course, remember big R was something given to us, so it's allowed to be in our final expression, and it's also a constant. Now the next thing I did was just pull out um, constants out of my integral. So current is a constant, that's part of the problem, and um, or part of the prompt that was given to us and capital R is also a constant, and so I can pull those out of the expression. So I'm left with the integral of one over uh, L squared plus R squared to the three halves DL. Now before evaluating this integral, we're gonna have to choose limits for the integral. We're assuming this wire is very long compared to that R expression, and so Basically, L is varying from negative infinity to infinity. Now, we know in the real world, in physics, um, infinity it doesn't really mean infinity. So it could be like this, this uh, wire is one meter long, and we're looking for the magnetic field one centimeter away from it. It won't make a huge difference if we're using um, the actual limits, one meter, versus using... Um, things like negative infinity and infinity. So let's just stick with the infinity for now. Now, here's a problem. If we use negative infinity to infinity as our limits, we will end up getting a magnetic field of zero. So instead, what we do is we'll derive that magnetic field for half of the wire, and then we'll just double the magnetic field that's created. And so you'll see that here. I chose as my limits going from negative infinity to zero, and I added a 2 out in front of my expression. So now to be able to actually integrate this expression, um, we're going to have to refer to a table of integrals because we can't use any of our tricks that we know. There's no ability to use u substitution or things like that to be able to solve this integral. Um, and so it is fair game to look this up. If I look this up, I end up getting an expression, of course, plugging in the variables that we have um, that looks something like what you see on the screen here. My next step is to integrate this, or sorry, to plug in my limits, plugging in zero and negative infinity. So I've done that right here. Then you'll notice that first um, expression in the parentheses ends up being zero, since I have zero in the numerator. Looking at that second expression, um, in my denominator, 
I have r squared plus negative infinity squared. If r really is much smaller than that infinity, then um, it really doesn't matter. So I end up having the square root of negative infinity squared. So we know the negative goes away. My denominator is basically just be, going to become infinity. And um, you'll learn this in calculus class about handling infinity over infinity, but basically it ends up just being one in physics here, because remember that infinity doesn't really mean infinity. Instead, infinity means some big number where um, it's equal on both sides. And so I'm left with in my parentheses zero minus negative one. And so my end expression for the magnitude of this magnetic field is mu naught i over 2 pi r. Now, of course, we've dealt with finding a magnitude of the expression, but magnetic field is a vector. And so we know that it also has a direction. And so um, for starters, we'll look at the right hand rule using the Biot Savart law. So we know that. Um, current is going upward, and so therefore dl is pointed upward. And um, we would wanna take the component of my r vector that's perpendicular to that when we're doing my um, right-hand rule. And so the component of that r hat that would be perpendicular to dl would be pointed to the right. And so using my right hand, I'd find that um, the direction of that magnetic field would be pointed inward. Now there's another way actually to come up with the direction of the magnetic field from a long straight wire. We have a slightly different right hand rule here. In this right hand rule, my thumb would point the direction of the current and my fingers wrap around the wire showing the direction of the magnetic field. This is done because the magnetic field actually creates circles around the wire. And so we can see whether those circles are kind of clockwise when viewed from above or counterclockwise when viewed from above. In this case, my magnetic field circles would be moving counterclockwise if I view my wire from above. If my current was in the opposite direction, so if my current was going downward instead, then those circles would just change their direction. Now, We've, we've uh, analyzed the Biot Savart law and the direction for a long straight wire, but another type of uh, wire that we'll commonly see will be a circular arc of wire. And so our goal here is to derive an expression for the magnetic field at a point P. And that point P this time is gonna be located at the center of the circular arc of wire. So basically, if this arc were a full circle, the point P would be at the center of that circle. Um, and it would be in the same plane as that circle as well. Uh, the circular arc of wire is gonna have a radius of capital R and it has a constant current that we're gonna assume is traveling counterclockwise. So it's kind of going upward in that arc. Just as we did for a long straight wire, we're starting with the Biot Savart law. And we'll start by finding the magnitude of the magnetic field due to a small piece of wire and that small piece of wire is going to have a length dl, as you can see um, in this diagram here. And so um, we're going to have to add up every little piece. I have once again just focused on the magnitude, so I got rid of the cross product. The r hat becomes 1. Um, now, when I'm adding up all of those dbs, I also thought a little bit about adding those. First of all, the sine of the angle. Well, the angle in general between my r hat vector, which would point from that little dl toward p, and dl is always going to be 90 degrees. And the sine of 90 degrees is 1. So that sine theta expression is removed from my final integral here. Um, my next task is going to be to pull out uh, constants. So we know mu naught's a constant. We know 4 pi is a constant. We know current is a constant. And in this case, every little piece of wire that I choose 
is that same distance capital R from the point P. So the only thing that I'm left with in my integral is dl. Now that's a really easy integral. As opposed to the last one, this one doesn't need any, look, any looking up in a table. As a matter of fact, the integral of dl is simply l. So here's my final expression for any arc of wire. Now commonly, uh, l will be expressed in terms of a portion of the circumference. So you may see a problem that says that it's a semicircle or half a circle, um, in which case I would use uh, pi times r for l. You may see something that says that it's a quarter of a circle. So pi times r over 2 uh, would be your l in that case, or it's possible that you're just given an actual length of the wire. Um, if we happen to have a complete circle of wire, that would mean that L is 2 pi R, and so then our expression becomes mu naught I over 2 R. Also, finally, if you happen to have something that has multiple turns of wire, so let's say that there's a um, hundred circles, and they're all very closely packed. We have a special name for that. It's something called a solenoid. And the expression for the magnetic field of a solenoid looks a little bit different. The magnitude of that expression is mu naught n i. And n in this case is the number of turns per length of the solenoid. Um, as you could probably guess, it is related uh, to that to our expression since it kind of replaces that in the denominator there. You do not need to know how to derive this expression for a solenoid, but you should be aware that it exists. It is on your equation sheet and you should be expected um, to be able to use it properly. One final thing to talk about in this video, and that's the direction for um, the magnetic field at point P. So once again, we can look at the right-hand rule. Um, we see the direction of dl, and in this case, my r hat vector will always be perpendicular to dl. Um, and so if I am doing that, I can see the direction of my magnetic field. This uh, words on here says that it's pointed inward. Please ignore that the magnetic field would actually be pointed outward out of the screen in this case. Now there's another new right hand rule that we could use to also come up with the direction of the magnetic field. Um, and so as you can see in this diagram here, if I have something that's like a solenoid, that's actually kind of what's shown here. So it's loops of wire. I would curl my fingers the direction that the current is traveling in that loop. And then my thumb would point the way that the magnetic field line is, so the direction of the magnetic field in that 